keeping your vow. Yeah, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. For two to be one, keeping your vows while keeping your vows. Bible-based, Christ-centered relationships. We still have a few things to talk about today. One is forgiveness, final exam. And uh, then I would like to address counseling and where to go to for help and what to do when you're desperate. Um, I'd like to read you some quotes that I have heard from couples. Things that couples have said that I've observed. And I'm very careful not revealing identities or couple cu couples come to me in private and, and now it's on YouTube. Uh, I will change a few things, but I think it's all anonymous and confidential. Oh, what are some quotes here? I'm just tired. I'm just tired. Well, that, that would require a few questions. Tired of your relationship, tired of your marriage, physically tired, your thyroid. Do you need to contact Brother Zadok for advice? Um, there's a, a thing called emotional fatigue. You, you're investing so much in a relationship and you're not getting it back out or it is not changing things. You're praying. You're trying to be a Christian and your husband is not responsive. My wife shows no interest in me. We have changed so much. You are not the person I married. Guess what? We all change over time. You're not the same person that you were five years ago. Uh, we don't communicate. I hear that a lot. I married the wrong person. I've heard that several times from different, usually uh, men and women, yeah, more than once. Uh, here's one. I never really loved my wife. Never really loved her. Uh, one couple told me, I don't, well, lady told me, I don't trust him anymore. Um, one gentleman after an affair told me, quote, I always knew a woman would get me. And uh, then I was standing outside the university at a building. We had a meeting. We came out. There were several pastors standing. Pastors. They were laughing and joking. And I said, hello. And, and one pastor asked a, a friend of mine who's a pastor, how's your wife doing? And he said, quote, I could not believe it. He said, she's acting like a real, and then he said a word that is not in the dictionary. I, I won't even say it on camera in the microphone. There's a friend of mine and a pastor, and he's talking like that about his wife without her being here. And the other pastor standing around, some were laughing and some thought it was awkward. And... Let me ask you something, especially gentlemen. Are you the man that you would want your daughter to marry? Are you the type of man? Are you the type of man that you would want your daughter to marry? Do you act in a way, talk in a way to your wife, your daughter's mother, that your daughter wants to copy, that she wants in her husband? All these questions have one thing in common, it is I, we, and they leave out God. And we tried the last five days now to not just solve our marriage problems, but to, to live a, a God-focused life, regardless of marriage. God and I, wife and God, and then we come closer 
together. I want to address a topic that is very difficult. Uh, forgiveness. I'll, I will show you what forgiveness actually means in the dictionary. Okay, I'm going to share the screen, um, read a couple of texts, and then we'll talk face to face. Um, not from a book, not from a classroom, but face to face. Incidentally, I've taken a counseling class. We never opened the Bible. At a Christian seminary, we discussed some fancy psychological tests all semester. We, we did not establish a, a Christian base for counseling. But let me share the screen and, and show you what the word forgiveness actually means. The man who had an affair and said, I always knew a woman would get me. They're still married today because of forgiveness. Hats off to that wife. Okay? That is hard to forgive. A complete betrayal of trust. Screen share. I'm currently disabled to share screen. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I can, I can do it without screen sharing. But uh, either Brian or Zadok can make it work. If not, it's okay. Um, if not... Hakuna Shida. There you go. That will do it. Asante. Yeah. That should work. And it's a good thing when I'm small, I must decrease. Uh, literally, by the way, I'm trying to get back to my high school weight. I'm 3.5 pounds. That would be um, 1.8 kilograms. No, 2.1 kilograms from my high school weight. Here it is, forgiveness. We have to forgive to live, but it is so difficult to do. BDAG is a famous Greek dictionary. It's very thick. I have it electronically on my computer and on my phone too. Here's what it says. I, I looked up the word forgive and I'm quoting straight out of the dictionary. It's amazing. To dismiss or release someone or something from a place or one's presence. Let go, send away, give up, emit divorce. Divorce and forgiveness can be the same term in Greek. It's a prepositional compound to, to send away. To release from legal or moral obligation or consequence, cancel, remit, pardon. And then they are quoting or referencing Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Do you know what Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 is? It is the Lord's Prayer, as we call it. Somebody once said it should be called the Disciples' Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is John chapter 17. That really startled me, John 17, verse 3, of course, when I learned about God just a few years ago in a way that I had never learned before. Matthew 6, verse 12. There is something in Matthew 6, verse 12 I want you to notice. Uh, I need to talk a little detail and grammar. I had to learn all this. English second language and Greek and Hebrew and Latin, all this. In, in language, there's an indicative and there's an imperative and there's a non-indicative. Imperative is a non-indicative. What does that mean? Well, indicatives are fact and reality oriented. Nina fahamu kiswahili kidogo. I understand a little kiswahili. That's an exaggeration. <laughs> Just a few words. Yeah, I, that's a reality. Ti fahamu kiswahili should I? I should say, I don't understand kiswahili. That that's a reality. It's a fact. Now, if I said I wished 
I understood Kiswahili. That's not a reality. It's, it's maybe one day I speak it fluently. Uh, learn Kiswahili, okay? study Swahili. That would mean somebody is telling you to do something, but you haven't done it yet. It's not reality. Did, do you notice the difference? I'm going to school, I'm eating, I'm speaking, I, I'm looking at you through the camera. These are realities. But um, if you believe, you will rise with Jesus at the resurrection. Maybe you believe, maybe you don't believe. I wish you would believe. That's not a reality, but it's a wish. So in the Lord's Prayer, there are a lot of non-indicatives. They're not reality yet. Your will be done. That's a wish. But we can violate God's will, heaven forbid. May your name be sanctified, hallowed, honored. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, by the way, it says bread, not cheesecake, candy, just simple bread. So these are desires, um, thy will be done. Then we have, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Very important. I'm going to stop the screen sharing for a second so I can look at you. In the Lord's Prayer, there is only one indicative, only one statement of reality that we as humans are doing. And that is forgiveness. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those are wishes for the present, for the future. They will eventually become reality. Lead us not into temptation is a wish. It's not an imperative. We're not telling God what to do. It is a solicitation, an appeal by a human to God. But that one little line in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our debts, comma, as we forgive our debtors, people who have sinned against us, that is an indicative in Greek. That is a reality statement. And then it is so important that in Matthew, Jesus repeats it. If you forgive, if you don't forgive. There's something else that is interesting. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God forgives sin. We forgive sinners. Huge difference. And sometimes we put the burden of forgiving sin on us. By the way, the dictionary did not say forget. Forgiving is not forgetting. For forgiveness is like a, a nail pounded in wood, and then you take pliers and pull it out. The nail is gone, but the hole remains, the, the scar, the wound. So forgiveness means you let go of, of that and turn the sin over to God and the consequences but you forgive the person. God forgives sin. We forgive sinners. God forgives sin. We forgive people. And it is in the Lord's prayer. And the Lord's prayer is the center of the Sermon from the Mount. It's actually architecturally designed. I, I won't go into all this, but the, the Sermon from the Mount is very nicely structured and the peak pinnacle of human experience and expression and action is prayer. And in that prayer, forgiveness is the highest form of Christianity. It is so difficult to do though. So, let me show you how it's done. Theoretically. Screen share on. Isn't that amazing technology? We can now, I can, I can sit in Texas and talk to Kenya. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 22, Peter asks Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Seven times. And, and you remember the famous response by Jesus, 70 times seven. 
which is 490. If you know anything about Seventh-day Adventism, does that number, I'm going to use an English idiomatic phrase, ring a bell? Does it get your attention? Jesus says, I want you to forgive 490 times. Now, it's a mathematical number, but he doesn't say 490. He says, uh, I will read it to you, English Bible, Matthew chapter 18. It's very important uh, because it enables us to forgive people that are, they have harmed us and wronged us and hurt us. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? You notice he puts the burden on the brother sinning against him first. Up to seven times, up to seven times. One, two, three, four, five, two more times, six, seven. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Not 490. 70 times seven, you're saying, Pastor, 70 times seven is 490. That's right. But Jesus is using a formula that comes from where? It comes out of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, which comes out of prayer. Daniel 9 is mostly prayer. And then comes the greatest prophecy ever given to humanity, I think. It includes the death of the Messiah. He's Hebrew karat. He's cut off for us. And then there is 70 times 7. 490. Pastor, you're complicated tonight. It's Friday evening. I'm tired. What are you saying? I'm saying the following. We are asked to forgive like God has forgiven his people. Are you following this? 490 years is 457 BC. Did you know marriage counseling includes prophecy? 457 before Christ plus 490 years leads to 8034. God literally had patience with his people for 490 years. And I think Jesus on purpose is using Jesus on purpose is using the formula 70 times 7 so that we would be reminded of of Daniel chapter 9. And after that, he still doesn't give up on his people. Anybody still through conversion can come to God and be saved. But the system changed and the evangelism now went to the Gentiles, all that. 457 to 8034, conversion of Paul, stoning of Stephen. And we know it's a moment of judgment because. Jesus went to sit at the right hand of his father. And at the moment Stephen is stoned, Stephen sees Jesus standing, not sitting. He, he stands up as judge. So for your personal life, we are not just asked to forgive. If you don't forgive, then God will not forgive you. There, there's a context to that. God is asking us to do something that he himself has demonstrated in history already, including Jesus' death, his baptism, conversion of Paul, stoning of Stephen. The entire prophetic package is a demonstration by God for us to do what he has done, but on a different level. He forgives sin, we forgive sinners. And Ellen White one time, I think it's, Christ object lesson page 333. I could be wrong. We'd have to verify that. All his biddings are enablings. So as difficult as forgiveness is, your husband has done horrible things. He's asking you to do something that he himself is enabling you to do and has demonstrated himself. And that's why forgiveness is possible. I cling to a story where Joseph was thrown into the pit. They wanted to kill him. 
Um, Ruben said, let's not do that. And they just threw him in the pit, soaked his coat in blood, then sold him to slave traders. He went to Egypt, didn't understand the language. Sina Fahamu, whatever they spoke. And he probably felt pretty bad about himself and his brothers. God grants him wisdom for the time of trouble. His brothers come to Egypt years later. Joseph is also left in jail. Life is unfair. Okay, He's mistreated. They did him wrong. And now his brothers come for survival and ask for food from Joseph. Think about emotions for a second, not just theology. This would have been the perfect time for revenge. He was right. They were wrong. And it would have been a good time to say, you treated my, me like that back then. I'm not giving you any food. You don't deserve it. Okay. And Joseph wrestles with himself. This is not from one week to another. This is over the course of years, a lifetime. And the pain in his heart left abandoned. He doesn't see his father anymore. Lost his brothers. They left him to die, practically, and then sold him. Terrible story. He weeps. He, he wrestles with his heart. He, he struggles. And then he forgives them, gives them food, invites the whole family, sees his father again, and they are reunited. And my brothers and sisters, I've, I've had to deal with, with this myself. I want to read you a Bible verse, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. I really tried not to talk about Trinity uh, in a marriage seminar, but it is, I think, the best example for my personal life, how difficult forgiveness is. Hebrews, this is my little studio Bible. I don't use it much. The pages are sticking. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So I'm, I'm not talking about the Trinity topic here, but I'll give you an emotional example from my life. In, in 2014, I was on a committee and, and a top level scholar said, God does not have a son. And I had asked God uh, right at that time, uh, the committee was about women's ordination. I had asked God, what is my next big topic? I had written papers on the topic, was at the General Conference Committee on that, made videos with Elder Bohr, Steve Bohr and others. Um, and then I thought, okay, what, I'm, what I do I need to study next? And, and then I heard God doesn't have a son. I, I was stunned. I knew what the scholar meant, but I couldn't say it like that because on every page of Biblia, uh, God has a son. And so I, I said, okay, I'm going to study that. And for a couple of years, quietly, secretly, I studied, I, I read the Bible, Greek New Testament, this, this one right here, this very book. I read it through twice, uh, cover to cover, and I became non-Trinitarian. It was very clear that the doctrine of the Trinity was false. I'm teaching for a university I'm a pastor and ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. Now I'm dealing with this. It's a long story. It's not my point here at all. But eventually it came out and I had to resign. It was either immediate termination, immediate, within 24 hours. And I'd worked for the church for almost 30 years. Or I could resign. For various reasons, I chose resignation and I was without work and one of my sons was still in denomination school I lost subsidy no more health insurance no more funding of retirement plan and everything that came with it and I, I was without work 
I was in this fellowship because the church I belong to, I started. They're my friends. They won't disfellowship me, at least not right now. So I went to Germany, <clears throat> see my parents, traveled a bit, praying. So what do I do next? And uh, I, did, I was uninvited from all camp meetings. For two years, I lost all camp meetings. No more invitations, except one. Listen to this, Zambia. I didn't go to Zambia, but we have lots of Zambians. And they invited me to their camp meeting in Texas. It was a great experience. They called me um, a mother from a different brother, but same father. And um, good experience, but I still didn't know what to do. And... I was hurt that the church didn't discuss my case, the, the local church, the university, there was no committee to investigate me. Uh, the world church just dropped me like a hot potato. There was no communication really, a little bit by a few people, but I left. I was left in the rain outside the walls of Jerusalem. And I had to forgive these people. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Revenge is, is sweet, you know, and, and thinking negative thoughts. And, and I had to forgive. And I, during that time period, I, I wasn't going to talk about it. I mentioned it yesterday. I will for the sake of you. That I'm not just sitting here in suit and tie and, and reading Greek and Hebrew and telling you about indicatives and you need to forgive your spouse. I have to do that myself because I was invited by a ministry who would pay me to work for them. But my wife was totally opposed to it. She almost had a nervous breakdown. She did not like the idea of me joining an independent ministry. And, and I... I was, it was 10.30 in the evening, early August, 2018. I will never forget that. It was dark outside. The stars were out. I'm on my driveway. And I decided I would become a hospice chaplain. That's a good reputation in the community. It is good work, money. I get health insurance again, a retirement plan. And so I did that. I stayed for one week. And my conscience was bothering me. I should be preaching the truth. Three angels message. I need to be out there and, and reach the world. And here I'm dealing with dying people, which is good work as well. I reach secular people I would have never reached before. So I'm, I'm very conflicted. I canceled the job. I said, I cannot come back. I need to teach and preach. But I didn't tell my wife. I didn't consult with my wife because I knew what she would say. Do you notice the mistakes I'm making? Uh, apart from theology and all that. And now I'm torn between um, Marco Takatifu, Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 29. If you don't deny your fields, your house, your children, your wife, then you can't follow me. But then on the other side, my, my conscience said, Ephesians chapter 5, you need to be a husband who's willing to die for his wife. My wife theologically recognized there was an issue theologically with the church. She fully recognized that, but she was not ready to take that step into independent ministry and leave the church and all that. So now I'm conflicted. Do I do what I think is right or do I help out my wife? I was not in a position where I couldn't talk what was on my mind, speak the truth. My wife did not hinder me from that. It was only an issue, how do I do that? Okay, I was not denying God by backing off and supporting my wife. And I was still speaking the truth about God and his son, Jesus Christ. So that, was, that wasn't the issue, but it was mental turmoil i was conflicted i was having a difficult time my wife was shocked that without consulting her i made such a huge decision about my employment without talking 
to her about it without praying together. Regardless of what I should have done and what God's will was, I was violating 422B1. And so now I'm back late evening, was a Sunday, I think, early August 2018. And I'm like, God, what do I do? There is bitterness in my heart towards the church, towards the world church, towards the university, and now towards my wife. What do I do? It's 10 o'clock in the evening. And I said, God, what is your will, not mine? And the impression I got, I was lying on the road. Uh, well, it's not a road. It, it is not a barabaraku. It's just a path up the hill to my house. And I'm, I'm lying on the ground. Dangerous in Texas, we have snakes. And I'm looking up to the stars and I'm saying, God, please help me. We, we are wrestling with self. I had to die to self. It's the darkest one of the darkest moments of my life. And God seemed to nudge me towards, you need to preach the truth, but you need to stay with your wife. I don't know if, if it would have caused a split. We already were split on what to do in life. but And I had the impression, become a chaplain for a while at least and be patient with your wife. Ephesians chapter 5. Like Christ, who gave himself for her. My non-Trinitarian friends couldn't understand what I was doing. They thought I was denying God. But I made this decision. I forgive. I start a process of forgiveness. And not allowing bitterness in my heart. And so I was a chaplain for several years. And then new offers came, new opportunities. I decided 2020 I would become full-time self-supporting pastor. So what I'm telling you is forgiveness is very, very difficult. I, I found it very difficult uh, to the degree of impossible without the help of God. And then I also discovered I can forgive in my head, but my heart is still two kilometers behind me. In my head, it is one time, okay? Not over and over, but in my heart, I had to forgive over and over and I still do with the church uh, still deeply wounded by the church that we don't have an open communication that there's no process that they don't see the truth it's still difficult to process today right now so I have to forgive again and watch my heart and the bitterness in my heart tomorrow does that make sense that's Ingo it's not Dr. Ingo Sorke Pastor Ingo it, this is Ingo. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. One of my favorite verses. Joseph tells his brothers, you meant it for evil. Evil. But God meant it for good. That means God, not me. Not a pastor, not a counselor. God can turn an evil situation, a negative situation into something positive. That, that is a miracle. Yeah, A negative is a negative is a negative. Evil is evil. I don't understand it. Ellen White says we can't explain it. But God can turn a bad situation and, and make something still good out of it. Amazing. So here's my final exam. Enough about me and myself and my sob stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Emotionally, I'm processing life with God. Here, here's an exam I give to couples. And um, then I will read you some quotes and we'll conclude. Uh, I pray you found it helpful. It would be interesting to see. I, I'm not after success, but it would be interesting to see if, if this series has helped any couple. Final exam. Being absolutely honest to God your future spouse, and to yourself. And I put that in there because we lie to ourselves so much. Be totally honest. And I've had couples not get married after this final exam. Well, what if you're already married? Well, then you have to deal with it for, with for two to be one and forgiveness and God's grace and prayer. But here are the questions I ask. 
I have surrendered my life to God, yes or no? Don't answer that too quickly. Have you? Have, have you actually did, done that? I did this morning again. Number two, I really want to marry, and then the name of your spouse. I've had women put no in that question. Then we have to talk about it. I, we canceled a wedding one time two weeks before the wedding. Invitations were out, cake was ordered, church was reserved. People had tickets to fly in. To, we canceled two weeks before the wedding. Better two weeks before than two weeks after. Okay. If I could, uh, I'm, I honestly believe God will be pleased with our marriage. I've had couples write no. So we have to talk about that and I have to listen. What is really going on? If I could somehow, some way, still get out of this relationship and save face, as an English expression, I would. I've had couples say yes, especially women. I'm only staying in this relationship because I've already invested too much into it. I've had people put yes here as well. Uh, I've had a couple tell me, uh, well, the lady told me, I knew this would not work out on my wedding day, be before the wedding was over, because the husband was abusive and she, this, she knew this wouldn't work, but she got married anyway because they were already too deep into it. Call it off. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it the night before the wedding if, if you think this is not going to work. Number six, I can tell my future spouse anything and everything. I put that question in there because I, I mentioned that before I was at a wedding. I'm standing there with the groom and the men that participate in the wedding, waiting for the wedding coordinator to say we're ready. And one man tells the groom, you know, your wife has been married three times or two times before you're number three. He said, I know my wife has been married once before. And, and the groom, groomsman said, no, she's been married twice before. The door opened. The wedding coordinator said, are you ready? And I said, yes, we are ready. He walked down the aisle to meet his bride in five minutes, knowing that she had not told him about a marriage relationship. Can you believe that? So I'm trying to intercept that, things like that. I, as I said uh, a couple of days ago, I've had a couple HIV positive. That was not the end of the relationship, but it meant uh, involving a physician, a doctor and healthcare and, and how does that work? They ended up not getting married, but not for that reason. Uh, there's still something I haven't told my future spouse that he, she needs to know. Yeah, things like that. I accept my future spouse for who she, he is and grant her him space to grow. I'm committed to unconditional loving, undistracted listening and unending learning. Thinking about marrying you, my greatest concern is. In this marriage, I see the biggest problem on my part being, this is one of my favorite questions and couples are quite honest, selfishness, money, anger problem, abuse in the past. Thinking about marrying you, I'm most excited about. My greatest contribution to this marriage will be the top reason we should get married is. The top reason we should not get married is. If this relationship ever failed, it would be because. Why? If I died before our wedding day, I want to know that. I want you to know that. I put that in there. We had a couple and we have train tracks not far from where I'm sitting. And the husband, one week after the wedding, tried to beat the train across the tracks. It's an optical illusion when a train comes and you can go around the barrier. Yeah. See, people do that a lot. Very dangerous because you cannot judge the speed and the distance correctly because of the side, size of the train coming at a 90 degree angle. And he got hit by the train and died one week after the wedding. The lady was never the same again. She got remarried, but uh, 
those are scar tissues emotionally for the rest of your life. Death before marriage happens as well. If this relationship ever failed, it would be because, okay, we have that. I still need to tell you that. Do you notice that I have this three times in this questionnaire and none of the answers are really my business, okay? Some things need to be told God to God and God alone. But I want to prevent disaster before the wedding, not after. I struggle with and... Most men lie about that, but most men struggle with lust and looking at things that they shouldn't. For better or for worse means that. So that's my final exam. Uh, for better or for worse, I'm, I'm praying for you. I really am. God is mightier than anything, any issue in the entire universe. Cling to him, and I can honestly tell you, even though I don't know you, naku, naku penda. and so does God, naku penda. But I have one more thing, P.S. I'm going to turn this off and switch something, and I think you will find this helpful. It's only one page, and here it is. It will not take too long it is uh yeah it's 8 p.m for you and it's sabbath and you're probably tired from the week but i think you will find it uh beneficial i hope you can see it quotes questions and answer answers what do you think about counseling and here i'm going to be very honest and transparent and i would do things differently now I've been to counseling myself for depression, including medication, and it was bad. The medication made me feel very strange. I was not myself anymore. The counseling helped some. The depression in my life started at age 10. It came out of nowhere, uh, 10 years old. That's pre-teenager. Uh, uh, Churchill calls it the black dog. I'm doing much better now without medication, no counseling. Um, and I'll tell you here in a minute how I overcame it. I still have to watch it. It comes like a dark cloud. Strange thing. But the medication was bad. Um, and I have a friend who committed suicide who was put on medication. And I think it was the wrong medication. And he gave up um, just a year ago or so. Uh, that was hard to deal with. So I quit the medication. That was not a solution for me. It was a chemical that changed Ingo. So I, I said, I'm, I'm going to find a different solution. And, and what I do is diet, sunshine, exercise, gardening, uh, spiritual input, prayer. I started praying after I thought I had already prayed. I really learned to pray. Not just quality-wise, but quantity-wise, but also quality-wise. And I had to change my life and my attitude, my thinking. And uh, with God, I think I'm okay. But I'm telling you that because I'm, I'm not just speaking against counseling and I don't know what I'm talking about and it has helped people and now I'm telling them not to or get rid of their medication. I don't know your situation, but I see a danger in counseling. And that is a couple, several couples that I've dealt with, they come to me and they tell me we've already been to counseling and it didn't work. Now watch what happens. This is serious business. You go to counseling. I, I had a guy tell me he has spent thousands of dollars on counseling and the marriage is still a disaster so what happens next think about that what happens next is now the couple has sought help and it didn't work what's the next step giving up now, not giving up on life but giving up on the marriage because see what happens is you go to counseling as a couple and it doesn't help your situation, then you think you already did all you could, you did the best you could, and it's just over 
there's no help available and forget it. And unfortunately, if you're into psychology and counseling and you're a counselor or so, I have to be honest with you. What do I do with those couples? They've, some of them have been in counseling for years and things are not getting better. They understand themselves better and all that, but it did not work. I agree, not every couple will follow my 4-2 to be one and the Bible method and God and prayer and, and the simple steps I've introduced here. But we have a serious problem if a couple goes to counseling, spends money, and it didn't help. And now they are all thinking the marriage is over. We tried and it didn't work. It's over. And it's not. So here is my suggestion. And I hope I don't get sued over it. Uh, you have to decide what, what you're going to do. But, but this issue of couples having been to counseling and it didn't work, that's a serious problem for me. Because it, um, it tells the couples there's no hope. Uh, we tried. Here's my suggestion. What's my best marriage advice? I, I'm serious about this. Go directly to Jesus. Read the Gospels. Put yourself in the story. Think about eternity. You got married at age 20, plus minus. You have 50 years to go. Time will not last that long, I don't think, but it's about 50 years. You're 70. Do not give up eternity over an issue on earth. You got to hang in there one lifetime. One lifetime, and it's a maximum of about 50 years for you if you're in your 20s. But I want to read you a couple of quotes here. They are, and then suggest uh, four books. I'll, I'll suggest the books now. Uh, we already talked about Bathsheba and all that. I would suggest as a couple, before you get a divorce, just do it. If it doesn't work, okay. Read Steps to Christ together. There's a chapter in there, What to Do with Doubt. But just read Steps of Christ. Simple book. Then I would suggest read Mind, Character, Personality. That's a little longer. And in many countries, not available, but it's online. Mind, Character, Personality. Ellen White dealt with discouragement. Um, and then, of course, read Adventist Home together, apart from reading the Bible together. But listen to the following quotes. Steps to Christ, page 68. We can directly turn to Jesus. Here it is. As the flower turns to the sun, that the bright beams may aid in perfecting his beauty and symmetry, so should we turn to the sun of righteousness, that heaven's light may shine upon us, that our character may be developed in the likeness of Christ. I'll read it again. And I have about 10 more minutes maximum. Five minutes. As the flower turns to the sun, the, that the bright beams may aid in perfecting its beauty and symmetry, so should we turn to the sun of righteousness, that heaven's light may show, shine upon us, that our character may be developed into the likeness of Christ. So I'm a, a hospice chaplain, good reputation in the community. The pay was very low, less than an Adventist pastor, but at least it was regular pay, health insurance, I had to pay for that myself. But it was good work, and I helped people. And I think I was in situations where I thought, God put me here this time for this family, most of them non-Adventist. And it was beautiful to deal with families at 1 o'clock in the morning. They're smoking, drinking beer, and I'm helping them with death and life and difficult situations. And I think it... it I can't say that I'm more Christ-like, but it taught me patience, listening, loving people that are unlovable. I saw a beauty in non-Christian people deep in the heart. You know, you take the surface aside, there's a heart in there that we as Adventists have not touched at all. A whole, pop a whole population that we are missing. I, I learned that. But I came to the point again where I'm driving three, 4,000 kilometers every month to visit families. 
And I thought, I, I need to preach. I need to teach. I need to be free to speak the truth. And I approached my wife again, patiently, a changed man with a different heart. And guess what? My wife didn't say a word. She paused. She thought. She listened to me. I didn't try to push. I'm getting out. I'm going to preach. I'm dropping my job. That's not the tone and the method for two to be one. For two to be one. We patiently and lovingly took time to speak with each other. My wife said, if that is what you think God has called you to do, if that's what you want to do, I will not be a hindrance. I will support you. And now we're doing this. Okay. We still have challenges with each other. We still have challenges in life. We still face difficult in impossible situations. Brother Zadok mentioned church. That's a challenge for me. Okay. Um, what do I do with church and, and fellowship and community and, and, and my theological situation, all that? But what a change. Now I want to read you the final quote for two to be one. Are you ready? Two minutes? This is important. There's a section I highlighted in pink. In the vision given me June 12, 1868, I was shown the danger of the people of God in looking to brother and sister white and thinking that they must come to them with their burdens and seek counsel of them. This ought not so to be. And by the way, I, I have a fellowship. I, last night, I spent uh, time with a self-supporting group, independent group. It was a beautiful fellowship last night. It was sweet fellowship. Here's the quote. It's also found, it's found in uh, Testimonies, Volume 2, page 118. They are invited by their compassionate, loving Savior to come unto him when weary and heavy laden, he will relieve them. In him they will find rest. In taking their perplexities and trials to Jesus, they will find the promise in regard to them fulfilled. When in their distress, have you been distressed in life? They feel the relief which is found alone in Jesus. They obtain an experience which is of the highest value to them. Brother and Sister White are striving for purity of life, striving to bring forth fruit unto holiness. Yet they are only erring mortals. Many come to us with the inquiry, shall I do this? Shall I engage in that enterprise? Or in regard to dress, shall I wear this or that article? I answer them, you profess to be disciples of Christ. Study your Bibles. Now, not, not just five minutes, but actually get into the word. It takes an hour or so. Sometimes I can find something in 10 minutes. Um, I found something interesting uh, this morning, and I didn't spend a whole hour in studying. Prayer is my absolute highest non negotiable priority. But I will study more tonight. Read carefully, prayerfully the life of our dear Savior when he dwelt among men upon the earth. Desire of Ages, page 83, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in the contemplation of the life of Christ and let the imagination grasp each scene. Imitate his life and you will not be found straying from the narrow path. Now here it comes, okay? My most important sentence. We utterly refuse to be conscience for you. But here it is. If we tell you just what to do, you will look to us to guide you instead of, listen, going directly to Jesus. Going directly to Jesus for yourself. Counseling. I think there might be a place for Christian counseling, and I have found some good Christian counselors who've helped me and my church members. But you have access to the master counselor of the universe, Jesus Christ himself. And, and we do it too fast, and we just think about it. Actually get on your knees and go to Jesus with your problems. 
You say, you've done it before. I say, do it again. Go directly to Jesus. No priest, no pastor, no Ellen White, no James White. Go to Jesus. Try it. Your experience will be founded in us. You must have an experience for yourselves which shall be founded in God. Then can you stand amid the perils of the last days and be purified and not consumed by the fire of affliction through which all the saints must pass in order to have the impurities removed from their character preparatory to receiving the finishing touch of immortality. Wow. I don't want trials. I want, don't want troubles in my marriage or in your marriage. Some things will not be solved until the second coming of Jesus Christ, but our, I'm not saying your, our vows were for better or for worse. And I don't have a worse marriage. I have a better marriage between myself and my wife, not in comparison to you. But there are things in life that will be bad until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hang in there till the end. Matthew 24, 13. He who perseveres shall be saved. For two to be one, we were put together by God in the Garden of Eden as husband and wife after six days of separation. All right. What do I say at the end here? Give God a chance in your life to change you and for God to, to save your marriage. Give him a chance again, please. It's been a privilege to be with you. Um, you can contact me. I will respond. And I will pray for you. I'm taking prayer more seriously than ever in my Christian walk and as a pastor. Uh, that's a promise. I think Gethsemane, Jesus wrestling with himself, finding his father, that that is the high point of the gospel, apart from Jesus' death. But in Gethsemane, I will close with this and pray with you. In Gethsemane, there was his will fighting against the father's will is a very odd situation. He's discouraged to the point of death because of our sins and our marriages too. And what we have done. And Jesus finds his father three times. And I tell you, I got to look at you directly. When you find your father, Based on the example of Jesus Christ, when you find your father, you can face your future. And when you find your father, you can face your worst possible future. But there's also the promise of the resurrection. May God resurrect your marriage. I'm going to kneel and pray. And uh, then I have to say, Wahiri, but again, love you. And it's been a privilege to spend this time with you. But uh, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, there are people here, uh, not just this very moment, but watching this later, who are utterly discouraged, frustrated, abused, wounded, not forgiven, not forgiving, cold hearts, hardness of heart. I want to pray about this resurrection miracle, that as we come directly to your son, Jesus Christ, that you will facilitate a change in us, uproot any bitterness of heart, Prompt us to forgive. Help us to grant our spouse a new start. Teach us patience. Develop patience as a fruit of the spirit. Long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, self-control. We seek you. We want to find you so that we can face our future. 
I want to pray for the couples hearing, watching this. Let two to be one again. Not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually as a couple. We pray for restoration through the gospel, for grace, for mercy, for overcoming, and for marriages that are saved and restored. I pray for singles, that you preserve their purity, holiness. Be the center of all our relationships. And we thank you that we can turn to you as the flower turns to the sun. Thank you, God, that we're not facing life alone. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday, I cleaned the house, cleaned the bathrooms, vacuumed the car for my wife. I vacuumed today. And tonight, to be an Ephesians 5 husband, I, I usually don't do that. It's not good to advertise yourself, but I, I want to be not just talking about it, but show that I'm, I'm trying to practice what I preach for two to be one. Uh, we have visitors coming this afternoon. My wife will be occupied, so I will take care of grandpa. I will give him a shower, uh, show him a nature view video about creation, take care of his medicine, supper, and put him in the bed. That I'm not solving my marriage, but I'm helping my wife when she needs me. I should do it more often, should do it better. Sanctification, process of a lifetime, but uh, I, I have to practice what I preach. God bless you. Um, Mungu you so Akubariki. Mungu Akubariki.